Good evening. Welcome to lecture 11. So we're going to leave, pick up where we left off last time. <clears throat> so last time I think, what did we leave off on? Uh, we were doing a, uh, where we left off. Yeah, so, okay, so it left off um, with a, wait, I did a half adder and then uh, kind of ran out of time to finish a full adder. So a full adder, the, the difference is, <clears throat> not a full adder, it's just called an adder. The difference is, instead of just getting uh, a, it takes into account the carry bit as well. Well, let's go ahead and do that. So this is a full adder. I've got time today, so let's go ahead and do that. All right. So I've got two inputs. X and Y. And So this represents our carry bit. Alright, so but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two, I'm going to combine them with an exclusive OR. And we're going to call this the carry in. So I'm call it C in. And I'm going to do another half adder, and this will be the, the C out from the first part. So what we're going to do is we're going to do another half adder with the results from the XOR and the C in. Okay, so... We're going to call this the sum. I'm going to do an AND on this. And then what I need to do... So here's the good news. Okay, so... What kind of a gate do I need here? So let's think about this just for a second. Because we do have to combine these two. Right, we see one half adder here and another half adder here. There needs to be something to unite them. Okay, so if we think about it for the carry bit, so we've got a carry coming in So in order for this one to be positive, both X and Y would have to be positive or on. Right? So both of those would have to be true or one in order for them to get a, a, a one coming out of that. But what happens when these are both one? What happens to this line? It has to be a zero. It has to be off. So this line and this line cannot be on simultaneously. Okay. This actually helps us to know what goes down here. Because since this is a zero, then this also must be a zero. If this is a one, this must be a zero. If this is a zero, this could be a one or a zero. We don't know. So because if this is a zero, that means we didn't get a carry bit, so they were either both zeros or one of them was a zero and the other one was a one. So this could be a one or a zero. It doesn't we don't know. So when we and this and this could be a one or a zero, we don't know. So this could be either one, 
Could be either a zero or a one, true or false, and it's same same thing. And this one, we know, right? We said, hey, we know this one's a zero. So if this one's on, if this one's a one, this one must be a zero. If this one, and if this one's a zero, then this could be a one or a zero. We just don't know. So if that's the case, we can actually do an OR gate here. Because we know we don't have to worry about both of them being ones at the same time. And that's that's the, the beauty of that. So we do this, and this is the C out. Okay, notice somebody earlier, um, they had learned C++. And so that's actually a word in C++, C out. That would be familiar for you. It's not because of this. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't, doesn't mean that at all. Okay, so this is a full adder. And that's where we were looking at before. Okay. And we can string these together. Because this C out here can be the C out, or the C in, for the next one over the next um, the next uh, next bit over right because if we're adding say let's say we're adding two numbers right one zero one zero one zero and one zero one 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 sure doesn't matter so when we add these two together in that first spot that so all of this circuitry is needed just to add two of these together. So this one is is on and this one is or no, this one is off, this one is on. So that means this will be on here uh, and also when we add them together this is a zero so we get a one here and a zero here. We don't have a carry bit because when we first start out we never have a carry bit. And so that's always going to be a zero. And so then we'll have a zero and a one. Or no. Uh, yeah, zero and a one here, which will mean both of these are going to be zero. So we're going to have a zero carry, which is correct, right? Because when we add a zero and a one together, we get a zero carry. And then when we take the one and the zero and we do an exclusive or on that, we get a one with a zero carry. So then we go back over here. And we add the, the two ones together, and we get an exclusive or of zero here, but one with, uh, but then a one down here, and then we take that, uh, the zero here, and that ends to a zero, so we get a one or a zero. So then we get a one for our carry, so it becomes a one over here, and then this is a zero, and this is a zero, and do exclusive or on that, that gives us a zero. Hey, look at that. This looks like we're doing it right. And this will continue on and we would get the rest of the numbers. Okay. All right, so let's look at something else. Maybe a little bit more complicated. I'm going to talk about a decoder now. So remember back when we first started at the beginning, we talked about what's inside the CPU. Here's, there's this ALU, and then there's a control unit. So that control unit decides what action must be done, what thing we're going to, what it's going to act, it's going to decide what's going to activate. And so that basically that's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to do something here for a decoding so that it helps us activate a specific piece. So one thing will get started up, and then the the rest will be will be dormant. Okay, so let's just do. I'm just going to do a two-bit one because it gets a little bit complicated, which is fine. We can we can handle a little bit complicated at this point. I think. All right. Put a not gate here. So what we're going to do, ah, no. 
close enough. Another little knot gate down here. We're going to do all the different combinations of this. So, let's start with both of them on here, and we pass that through an and. And then we'll go with the first one on. the second one off. All right. So then we'll go with oops, this one off. And this one on. That's another and. And then both of them off. And yeah, those are pretty close together, but that's all right. You get the idea. So I can say that this, right, this one is xy, this one is xy prime, this one is x prime y, and this one is x prime y prime. I really should probably be saying complement on every single one of those because that's really what I mean. But <clears throat> Fair enough. Okay, so the question is, how many of these can be on simultaneously? Think about that for a second. Well, we could do a truth table on this, or do we need not need to? I don't know. So let's think about it for a second. Well, if they're both on, right, then this one will be true, right? Because that's a the 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 the, the non-complement. So if they're both ones, then we'll get a pair of ones here, and this will become a one. But what will the other ones do? Well, this one is a 1. Okay, well, this could be possible then here. But this is a 0, right? Because it goes through that NOT gate. So it flips it from a, a 1 to a 0. So now this is 0. Okay, so that one can't be good. And then, and then here, these bottom two both rely on the x complement of x, which means those will both be 0. So, you know, and those can't be both true. And indeed, actually, that's the way it works. So that way, only one will be on in any given instance. So what it does is it takes this. Now, okay, what? So, oh, right. So it takes two inputs and it turns it into four. Does that mean it always just doubles? Well, what would happen if I added in a Z here? Let's think about this. I'm not going to draw the whole thing in, but let's just think about it for a second or a minute. I would need to make another full copy of this down here, right? One for when z is positive and one for when z is negative. Or the opposite, right? So the complement, sorry. The one for z and one for z complement. And then I would just take the z and connect it to all of these and the Z complement to all of the other ones we copied down here. All right, so then if we get three values, one on each of these, how many of the eight would we... So so we, we did just, we added one here, so then three goes to eight. 
And we would repeat that process if we had another one. So let's say we had a W as well. So then we would take that 8 and we would connect a W directly to each one of those ands. And we would, the complement of W would connect to a copy of each of them in a, you know, farther down the chart. So it looks like each time we add one, we double the number of possible outputs. But we do need to define right if there's one, then it's two possible outputs. So there's a nice little pattern there. <clears throat> okay. What, what it means is, right, is that, so one of the things I can think about, right, this was one and one. So if this was one of these we considered the zero digit and the other one the ones or a twos digit or the ones digit and the twos digit in base two this would be one one or three so I'm gonna call this I oh I'm not gonna call it I three I'm gonna call it output three and this one will be out Output two and output one, and that denotes what zero. So this one will only be on when both of these are off, or both of these are zeros. Which means if this was the ones or the the ones place, is that how we're doing it? No, this is the twos place. This is the ones place. So it would go like this: x and then y in that order. So this represents then the value of those two bits put together in their proper positions. And then if we had a Z here, then the Z would take over the one's place. This would be the two's place and this would be the four's place. And then we would go seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Hopefully that makes some sense. Patterns are great. Okay, but I don't need to worry about this for now. That was just something to think about. Okay. So I want to talk about this decoder, right? So this decoder takes takes some value or some number and turns it into a single on line. Then we can feed that line into the thing that we're going to do, like kind of the machine or the, the circuit that we're going to do. And we're going to push it in there in such a way so that we can... Uh, we can allow things to, to get output only when this is on, or a one. Let me show you how this works. I need our line here. Okay. I'm going to call these S's S0 and S1 this time. They're used for controlling things. And I'm going to give myself three inputs. I3, I2, I1, and I0. So basically, I've renamed X and Y from this. And now these are going to go to these corresponding AND gates here. All right, so we need to get this to come off here. Do it again.
All right, so this comes up, goes into here, but we're also going to pull this one in. Then we'll do one here and then we're going to pull this one in. So what happens is, right, these two here decode into one of these lines being on. And I can add this in at the same time as, because when I add it into the same time, it means that AND gate will be activated, right? it'll be on. Be, so any data that comes to it will just automatically pass right through it. All right, so then let's Look at the next one here. And where is this? And we bring this one up. And then finally, oh, I made a mistake here, didn't I? Yeah, nobody corrected me. The second place doesn't get that, does it? It gets this. Now we pull this down. And this down. Then we get this one to go in there. Now, instead of being too close or too far apart, you get the general idea. Okay. So, just like here, we could say that only one of these could be a one. In fact, one of them has to be a one. Which means one of these is activated. Which means of our input, only one of them is possible to come out of here, to be a one. It could be a zero. But we transform, so we open up one of these AND gates by, by providing these two uh, S, S0 and S1. So we, it, by, depending on which, which ones are ones and which ones are zeros, we take these two and we turn this into one of these AND gates opens up. And so because it open, what I mean by that is, since both of them are ones that are going into it, that means that whichever input... Whichever input is going to that AND gate, automatically, whatever value that one has, it just simply gets reflected onto the other side. So we could think about it as kind of opening a gate and we're just going to let that input through. So because of that, we can AND all four of these, or, or for all four of these together. All right, so this actually has, so this has a name. It's called a multiplexer. A multiplexer. A multiplexer says it selects a binary information from one of many inputs and directs it to an output. So in this case, this is our output. So we know that these all these circuits are going on inside of there, 
But what we're going to do, because it's very difficult to kind of think about these problems when we have 100 gates on the paper. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this multiplexer here. Multiplexer. And we have four lines coming in. Input three. Input two. Input one and input zero and then over and then down here we have s zero and s one and then a single output So what we can do is we can think is that these two help us decide which of these gets copied right directly over to the output. And that's a good way to think about that. How does this help us decode? Well, if I pick two zeros at the uh, on these S's here, what we'll do, then, is the zero is the one that will pass through. So we can kind of think about it. So this is a zero, and this is a zero. You can kind of think about it like this. And some, or similarly, we could actually do a two, which would be what, a one and a zero. And if that was true, then this one would be the one that would go across there. So what it's doing is it's picking which of these inputs is going to become the output. This is what a multiplexer does. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. Let me get my microphone over here. That might help. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to have to mount that arm over the weekend so that we can bring that in so I don't have to have it in the way for my keyboard okay Now remember before we talked about error detection? And one of the simplest ways to do that is with uh, a parity bit. Like we could do, uh, you know, we could do a Hamming code, but that's that's a little bit more sophisticated. We don't want to do that and the, and the gates will get really complicated. But if we say X, Y, Z, P, P standing for the parity bit, and we want to do odd parity. So then this be let's do even parity. Sorry, let's do even parity. Parity even. This becomes a zero. Zero, zero, one. This becomes a one. Zero, one, zero, another one. Zero, one, one. That's a zero now. Uh, one, zero, zero. Need a one there. One, zero, one, zero. One, one, zero, zero. 
one, 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 one. I realize, right? The rest of these are dictated, right? Because it's a truth table. And this, uh, the p-even, I'm actually figuring it out, right? So I'm doing it as I go. So this, these are even already. I don't need to add a 1 to keep it even. This is currently odd, so I make it even. This is currently odd, so I make it even. This is even, so I leave it. So I don't do anything. This is odd, so I make it even. This is even, so I leave it alone. This is even, so I leave it alone. This is odd. I'm forced to use this to, to bring it back into even. We can do this quickly with a gate. Only one of these configurations can be true. So what we need to do is we need to make it so that this happens. OK, let's try to do this. So here's the best part, is I don't have to concentrate on doing all of them. Although, mm, do I need to do them all? Yeah, no, I don't. Maybe I should, but... <clears throat> we can just do a sum of products here, right? So if all three of these are zeros, or complement, so we're going to take the complement of each of those. Uh, and we get the answer. Oh, wait, no, no. That would be if they're all there, right? This one is not. What's there is Z. <clears throat> so when we look at the next one and we say just Y. So Y will be there. There's X. And Z is the not version. And we skip this one and we go down to the bottom one. So that says X. Not Y. Not Z. And we go to the last one. That's all three of them being on. So X. Y. And Z. And then we bring them all together in one big AND statement. Nope, not an AND. Sorry, that's my mistake. One big OR statement. So this becomes our P-even.
So we don't have to do any calculations in RAM or anything else, no assembly. We just have this gate that takes those three inputs and generates our, our P even. This would look completely different. In fact, all of the zeros would become ones and all of the ones would become zeros and we would we would have drawn a completely different gate. It would still look similar in that it's each of the ands in the first step are going to be triple parts and then the or at the end is going to have four parts. Is it ever possible for two of these inputs to be true? The answer is no because each of these is going to be unique like this first one is all three of them in an off uh, no sorry Z is in on so Z is a one so and then X and Y are both zeros and then the comp so then the complements come up here and then that gives us three three ones because those, because x is zero, then its complement is a one, and the same with y. So, so we combine that with the z, which we already said was one. So then those three get combined, and that one gets turned on. And if we looked at the others, none of the rest of them would be turned on because they would have something that's different. Okay, so We could include these other ones here. But we don't need to. Yeah, we probably do. We do. We would have to do the rest of them as well. Um, except for they're going to get a uh, an, an and and then they're going to have a knot at the end so it's going to flip them over so if they're a zero well no that doesn't no 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 we can't do that never mind we would not do that because we don't want we want this to be a zero so if none of the things that make it into a one are true are on are ones then then we're going to get four zeros here, and then we're going to get a zero, which is what we want. So this is correct. This is enough. Okay. Similarly, although it's a little bit more different, difficult, we can use the parity bit. We can use the, um, the parity bit. So when we get the message in, it can have an X, a Y, a Z, and then a P, P even. And then we can check to see with circuits if that indeed is correct or if there's an error in that message. And if we recall correctly, the parity bit only can tell us if there's an error. It doesn't tell us where or what happened. Um, it's also possible that if there's two errors that, uh, although it's not guaranteed, but if there's two errors, there's a, there's a chance that we will get a false positive, right? So if there was two errors, Right, so let's let we look at this first one here, or the second one. I'm sorry, we could get a we could get a false reading. So if this one here uh, gets two two flips, so then this becomes a one and this becomes a zero, just like the line below it. Well, that's a one, so and it's supposed to be a one here. So we would we would read it wrong, but we would come to the same the right conclusion, out of pure luck. But that would always be when it's an even, uh, even number of mistakes in, in this version. All right. Um, there's another thing called a bit shifter. And usually it'll be a certain number of, of bits. So like a 4-bit shifter. That's two words. 4-bit shifter. Hmm. 
this is what we're going to do. I'm going to draw this box like this. It has inputs. I3, I2, I1, and I0. But also, there's a control bit, but a single one. So what this says, so this is going to shift. It's either going to multiply by 2 or divide by 2, throwing away any extra, uh, anything that falls off the edges. Just replaces them with zeros on the other side. I'll leave it to you to figure out how this is implemented. But basically, if... If a 1 comes into here, then we shift everything to the to the right. And the I0 falls away and we lose that accuracy. And we replace it with a 0 on the other side. If this is a 0, then we shift the other direction. And so then the I3 will be disappeared. Unless we... <clears throat> All right. So, and then that will give us, ah, it's going to give us four outputs. Output three. Output zero. And I'll leave it to you to look that up. There are going to be diagrams and things out there, but I think it would be a good it's a good idea for you to understand how that works with the gates as well. It's actually kind of neat. And there there is a diagram in the book. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about how it recognizes these things. So, I'm going to draw a graph. It's going to be a real simple graph. The graph is going to show the level of the voltage of the wire. So basically, if it's high, high, high voltage or low voltage, and this kind of measures how much electricity is there. And that's enough. We don't really need to get into any of the details of it. So it goes along there. There's a zero. This is going to be, you know, at regular intervals here. We could have nothing going on, and then we'll come along a little later, and it's got a couple of things. So we have a high, a low, a leading edge here, and a trailing edge here. And this is really a good way to describe here. All of these up top here, these are all going to be ones. And all the lows are all zeros. And so what's going to happen is the computer has a timer. And that is actually the, the hertz of your computer. So rather it's 
probably gigahertz or whatever. That's the processor speed. So what's going to happen is that it measures how often it checks the line for data. So it's going to check here and then here and then here and then, or I'm sorry, here and then in the middle and then here and then here and then here and then here and then here. So it's actually quite important to make sure that your computer doesn't get off clock. Because if it gets off clock, it might not hit these in the right spot, especially if the interval gets wrong. And so that's why anytime you're going to transfer data, the both of the two computers need to decide what rate at which we're go they're going to send it so that it knows how often to sample the information. And this goes holds true for both electrical wires on say like a um, like a cable uh, network or on a on light or fiber optics on a DSL. So or DSL is a little bit different, but but the fiber uh, uh, so like the Gigazon stuff here in Bemidji. Oh, you guys wouldn't know about what's going on in Bemidji, do you? <laughs> uh, we have a really wonderful internet company up here, and they have a, something called Gigazone, which is gigabit uh, fiber. <clears throat> All right. So, I'm going to show you a way something called a flip-flop, sometimes also called a latch, but we're going to call it a flip-flop. And in this case, we're going to go the basic flip-flop, because we're, there are other kinds of flip-flops out there that are more uh, interesting. Not interesting, but they're derivatives of this one. All right, so... Okay, so we're going to have two different lines coming in, an S and an R. S means set, R means reset. Only one of them can be on, but they can both be off at the same time. So they could both be zeros. That's not good. What happened? Did I lose? Well, hopefully the video kept going. Yeah, it looks like it's still good. Okay. So, <clears throat> oh, that's weird. All right, so I'm backwards. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I did that so that um, it was easy to uh, to read things, right? So like I could hold up the book, and you would be able to read the book. Is that correct on YouTube? We got some latency here. Yep. Okay, it looks right. All right, so it's just it's just a little bit behind. So okay, so uh, one or the other, but not both of these two can be true, or or ones. They can both be zeros, though, right? So if we if it's if it's currently off, we can just leave it off. So it says don't change anything, no change. That's what how a flip flop works. Okay. All right. So we're gonna go into a nor here, and we don't have the second thing yet. This is where it gets a little interesting. U prime. Uh, what's a Q represent? Q represents. Ah, this is the current state. So the Q represent the current state. Oh, that's right. Okay. So, and the reason why we use the letter Q, it actually has to do with uh, other other algorithms and other things. Okay. So we'll. we'll we can talk about that later. Okay. 
All right, so we also have here as another nor, and this one goes to Q. So that's the current state. Well, you might ask, well, why do we do this? And this doesn't make a lot of sense. The reason is, is because we're going to do this. I'm going to drop this. And I'm going to bring this down around to here, and I'm going to stick it into there. And I'm going to come here, I'm going to grab this here. I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to stick it into there. All right, so let's look at this and see how it works. Let's assume at the beginning that Q is, is zero, right? So then uh, the complement of Q is one. So we use red to represent that it's a, it's a one or true. And this will be on, this will be fired up here. And this blue represents a zero. And so this is a zero. Okay. So let's see what happens when we when we put in a set here. We turn the set on. And the reset we leave off. Okay? Right because if they're both zero then it just it just stays the way it is. Uh, well, we could monitor that one first. Let's just let's think about that, right? So it says nor, not or. So we or it first, and then we do the opposite. So if they're both zero, we turn it on. So remember, this one was on to begin with. If we had two blue lines coming into here, or two zero lines, then we would turn this to red. It's already red, so it stays on, it stays red. And then down here, if we have one of each, that means the or would be on, it would go to on, because it's or, right? But then it says not or, so that means it turns off. So if they're both the same, we're going to come up with a red to come out of there. If they're both different, we get a blue. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So remember, I started with these two. Okay. But what's going to happen is when these come into here, we get to recompute this one. Not get to, we have to. But remember, that's red. So this is red going into here. So this becomes a blue, coming out, right, and this up here becomes a blue, no, this becomes a blue, so then this blue comes down here, and then this turns into a red. So that becomes red. And we have two reds, which would be on, or it would be a one. But then we can do the not, so that becomes a zero. So it rechanges this around to a different equilibrium. So now the state has a one here. And if I flip these around and I put the red here and the blue here, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and try that, see what happens. Let's flip these two around. Put the blue here. Put the red down here.
<clears throat> so then what that does is it makes us erase oops, erase these again. But we have a blue and a red, right? A blue and a red gives us a blue. So this becomes blue. We can erase this. So then this blue comes up here, and then the two blues eh, gives us a red coming out, and then that red comes down here, and two reds are coming in, but one of them is, um, or they're, they're both so that would make this coming a red coming out, but then when it gives, goes through the little knot on this nor, then it turns into a blue again. So it stays a blue. So we're in equilibrium now. So what happens here is what this does is a long, as long as we still have power to this, This will continue to remember what state it's in. Is it a true or a false? And so it actually, we can actually use something like this to represent a bit in our, in our memory. So like in a register. We can use something very similar to this, a, gate, a set of a series of gates very similar to this, to remember where things are in memory. <clears throat> now, what happens if, right, I have to have some kind of a clock, right, in order to kind of catch these. So I need to put a clock in here. So this is what's going to happen. The clock says, turn on when the thing is, when we want to sample S or R. What we need to do then, is we need to erase a little bit here. We have this S coming in, and this clock and we're going to do an AND there. And then we're going to do the same thing down here. Get rid of a space here, some spots. And put us an AND in here. So what will happen is the this will be zero 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 zero, and then when the clock hits, when it's time to sample, then we're going to hit this clock. This clock is going to hit, and so then it'll automatically change. Potentially, it'll automatically now let these things. So these are kind of you can think of them as blockers or gates, right? So we're going to we're going to open this gate up by putting a one in there. So now whatever's in S will automatically shoot through. Whether it's a zero or a one. When we have a zero coming in here, then we don't care what's coming from S. This is always just going to be off. But remember, when both of them are off, we don't change the state. It continues to stay in whatever state over here that it was in. So we do the same thing. We can kind of walk through this and see what's going on there. All right, good. Yeah, that was a weird glitch here. What was it, 10 or 15 minutes ago? My uh, my OBS said that it quit broadcasting. I'll have to go and look and see if it um, if it glitched or what happened here. All right, so this is a flip flop with a clock on it. 
One of the problems that we run into is if we if we put a positive in on both of these two, with the clock or without it, doesn't matter, if both of them are ones at the same time, what will happen is this whole thing gets messed up and both of them get turned off or both of them get turned on. It depends on the state that it's in currently, but they be, both be equal to each other and we can't have that. So it's an illegal state. So, so what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to make it so that uh, oops. Here. yeah we need to make it so that the yeah okay so let's let me let me just kind of because we can do boxes like this this is actually great so okay so I can do a box like this and this is our flip flop flip flop with the clock FFC so we can introduce a different kind of flip flop and that's one that keeps this from going bad okay so so let's think in here we have an S coming in and an R coming in and then a clock coming in and going out we have a Q prime and a Q actually I'm going to put the prime on the bottom So it just basically the it, it switches around a little bit how it, it works. But <clears throat> I'm going to call it a JK. So because both of these, okay, if this is on, so that this is a one, that means the only thing we're going to open up, the only gate that we're going to open up of these two gates, we're going to open up this gate, so we're going to allow it to do a reset if it wants to. But we don't allow it to do a set because it's already turned on. So we don't need to worry about that. So if it tries to set again, then we just ignore it because we'll just continue in the same state that we're in. And if it's off or a zero in Q, that means by definition, that means by definition that this Q complement must have a one in it which means as we go up here we open this gate so that whatever's in j or whatever's the set can come in so if it's currently in an off position the only thing we allow to come in is a set which means because remember before i said there was a problem here if both of these were on at the same time then it would 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 mess up the system but in this case if both of these are on it doesn't mess up the system because only one of them is being looked at the other one is ignored and then we can also put our clock in here that you know allows us to to do the to to only check it cert at certain times when the clock go, uh, is on the leading edge And this is another kind of flip-flop. This is called a JK flip-flop.
Right. So if both of them are in, that what will happen is it will if both of them are on, it will change the state. It will switch the state. So if it's on currently, it'll turn it off. If it's if it's off, it'll turn it on. So that's what happens when both of them are ones. It will automatically flip it. So flip the state to the opposite state. If this is if it's off, right, it'll turn it on. If it's on, it'll turn it off. And then we still have this being potentially coming through to set and this potentially coming through to reset, depending on the state of our machine, right? Because if it's already off, we don't need to reset. We'll just ignore a reset. And if it's on, we'll ignore a set. Oh, yeah, this is actually a good time to talk about this. All right. We're going to talk about a finite state machine, or FSM. Finite state. machine this is this is uh, this is used to model systems that are really simple like a timer like a street light like the arm for a railroad crossing or the arms rather because there's multiple usually and how do we deal with that okay an elevator right these are finite state machines we could think about them as computers right like in an elevator does it have a computer in there that's going to regulate which floor it goes to well Kind of, kind of, yes, and kind of no. It's it's all mechanical or handled by wires only. It doesn't have a computer in there. A lot of them, some of them maybe do now. But the older ones did not. And they were fully electronic. Same thing with the stoplight. Here's an example. Actually, this is an example. I like this example. But, well, let's not do that. Let's model this flip-flopper. This flip-flop, this JK flip-flop. Okay, so if we say this is state A, and state A represents that Q is in a zero state, and this is state B, and B represents that this, the that the state the state of the machine is currently in a one situation or active. So that this is a finite state machine. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw uh, circles that are going to be the state of the machine. And then we're going to draw arrows that tell us which state it's going to go to. So if both of these are zeros, it says keep the same state you're in. So like, I'll go like this. This is a zero. So if both of them are zeros, we just stay in the state we're in. If we're here and it's currently off and we get a reset, right, which would be the K, then we're just going to stay in that state as well. And over here, if it's on and we get a set, and, on, and then here, if it's on and we get a reset, I'm going to go over there to turn it off. And if we get this, which says switch the state. Okay, that's good. Let me come here and do this. 
if this is off, if it's off currently, and we say set, then we'll we'll go over here and we'll have it on. And if we say one one, which is says is switch the state, so then it will switch to the other state. So this is one way to do this. These this is a. Uh, uh, It's a real simple thing. Um, I just kind of want to introduce a little bit. We're not going to really talk too much more about it, but that's certainly one way to think about it. And so, if, like, if we tried to do, say, an elevator, we would have to have a state for the elevators going up, a state for the elevators going down, um, a state for the elevator being on each individual floor, uh, like on floor one or floor two or floor three. Um, we would also have to have... We have to deal with something when people push buttons. So we have to deal with certain buttons have been pressed but not handled yet. And so there's a lot more. It's actually fairly complicated to do an elevator. Uh, it's also fairly complicated to do a, a light for, the, um, for a railroad crossing. Right, because there are sensors from coming from both different directions. Uh, and they happen before the train gets to a spot where the arm has to come down. So then you have to deal with all that. Uh, and, and it's a little bit more complicated than something simple like this. So we go to, you know, something real simple like a, uh, uh, like a stoplight. Um, well, we could do like a crosswalk that's not associated with a, uh, with a, with the stoplight. So there, there's an example of this in Bemidji here. I don't see very many of them. I haven't seen very many of them. So um, there's a long stretch or fairly long stretch that of road. Uh, it's a split, split road. So it's two lanes going each direction with a half a block between them um, that runs right along the lake on the south side of the lake. Uh, and they realized that there was a problem because there's a Dairy Queen there and people who are out on the lake like to come up and put their boats right on the shore and then walk across the road to go to Dairy Queen. So they put a crosswalk in there, although there is not a stoplight. There's not a need for a stoplight because all of the cars would be pulling out and going with the traffic because there's only one way you can turn. <clears throat> so they put this crosswalk in. So what happens, right, if somebody pushes either of the buttons, then we're, we're going to stop traffic coming from both directions. But we need to put up a yellow first, or a warning first, and then a, and then a, um, a stop. So it's, it's kind of interesting how that works. You have to check it out. Maybe we could find a picture of it. Um, do we want to talk anymore? Uh, I don't know that I need to introduce to you deterministic finite automata. Uh, so this right here, this finite state machine, um, this is actually something that would be covered in a, why am I drawing a complete blank on it? Um, it's a computation, theory of computation, sorry. Um, and and that's also where uh, deterministic finite automata. Uh, it is a very good class to learn. It's an extension of what we're going to do, at least in a theoretical sense. The whole thing is theory, actually. It's really, really kind of interesting. Uh, and it gets into some of the things that Alan Turing actually created as well. So because he created something called a Turing machine, which is a theoretical way of thinking about how to do a program. Uh, and I, I would suggest, if you get a chance later in your uh, CS journeys, uh, to take a theory of computation. But uh, I do suggest that with a little bit of a warning, because it will be the hardest, some of the hardest material that you'll ever run into. So that's just, that's the way it is. Uh, but but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting class. Um, I think it's a fun class. It was one of the funner classes. Um, I didn't know what I learned in that class uh, until I came back and had to take it 
or I had to teach it. So when I went and taught it, then I realized all the, some of the things that I actually learned from it. Um, it's it's an interesting class, to say the least. It's actually quite interesting. Uh, do I need to go? There's a oh boy. There's a there's actually a really neat model in here about how how data is actually stored in a computer, um, and it actually uses data storage, right? Where it actually stores it. Um, and it looks a little different. That, that means in RAM, though, right? So it's going to make use of, of these, these JK. Actually, I think it uses a D flip-flop, which is actually an enhancement again. Uh, but we're not. I'm not going to cover anything more on that, I don't think. I think that's pretty much... Uh, there. There is more in the book about like designing circuits and stuff. Do we want to cover any of that stuff? Um, I don't know if we will. I don't. Th I don't think we're going to. I think we'll just let it let it be. And and if you guys want to look at that or cover some of those different things, designing some of those circuits, that'd be great. Uh, but it's up to you. Um, it's not something we it's be required for the class. All right. Uh, hopefully nobody's having too much trouble with uh, assignment three. Um, I will look to uh, to grade that actually over the weekend. I, I'm behind uh, with the grading because um, I would have normally graded assignment two, but since it wasn't due until Monday, um, I just have not had time. And so we'll try to get some time in the next, next day or so, um, and I should get that out to you guys, returned out to you. Um, if you have any suggestions in the way that I'm grading it, not necessarily in the method, but in the way I'm communicating it, uh, let me know um, if there's things that you don't understand. So it's perfectly fine. Um, like again, it, it's all about the process. So it's more about learning everything than about getting everything right. So, okay. Uh, but for the most part, everyone did really well on, on the first one. And I anticipate the same kind of level on the second one. So we'll we'll see we'll just keep keep on plugging here. Uh, that's it. I think that's that's what I've got. So I will I will talk to you guys again next week, and hopefully you'll um, all have a really good weekend. All right, bye bye.